it's very hard to predict the future. I actually think it's not um, possible. I'm somebody who does not believe in predictions. I believe more in a vision like how we just uh, saw. And I will illustrate uh, my point. This is uh, how we saw our urban future around now, uh, just uh, 25 years ago. This is from a scientific magazine. This is actually a serious attempt to predict, you know, what the future would look like now. And, um, well, we all know that this has not become our reality. And the, the same counts for what we say now. I think we can explore a vision here, but we can today not make a prediction about our future uh, cities. So, another aspect is, you all know these rankings of like the best city in the world, and you know, the most livable city in the world. And that's all these kind of cities, you know, Vancouver, Melbourne, Zurich. And these are, in a way, easy cities. They are very well maintained. They are mature in many ways. They are manicured. You know what I mean? It's easy, of course, everybody likes it. But to live there, and I'm sorry for those who live in Melbourne or in Sydney, but it's perhaps a bit boring compared to Guangzhou and these exciting places that Rocco was just telling about, you know. These are manicured places. And um, in my view, they're not tackling the real issues of the livable city of the future. Because there are other cities in Asia, in Latin America, everywhere in the world, in India, that are growing far faster and where the problems and the issues to tackle are far greater. And to create a livable city there, for example, we need to think about the pollution in the air or, first of all, the, the jobs that we create for the people. Very fundamental, basic things. But let me zoom in a little bit more on uh, the sustainability side. I think what is on the screen here is really an important notion. And I'm very keen to hear also your feedback after this short talk, when we have the panel, if Jeremy allows me to say that, I don't know where he is, but... Um, that we're now all busy creating our own sustainability strategy, city by city, government by government, corporation by corporation. We do our own thing. And we're all busy with the same thing, which is our planet, right? We all live on one small world. So why don't we explore the possibility to create one public domain of sustainable solutions where everyone can benefit from? Now that's my message for today. And I think the way that could come together is untraditional in many ways. I work for a big corporation, as you probably know, I'm the head of design at Philips Lighting. And um, when we develop something new, we try to validate it first at the beginning. We want to know if it makes money, if there's a market for it, if, you know, if it's a relevant solution. But going that way on the development and design highway means that you may miss, you know, the little side streets where there are very interesting things to explore. So instead I would propose for this public sustainability domain not to validate the propositions up front, but to explore many ideas, collaborate, see if we can mature them and enrich them, and only then to review and select, and then implement a few that fly really high all over the world. Because we have to ask ourselves new questions, because the world has changed. And we shouldn't think so much about the future when there is so much to solve today. Thinking about the future has become almost an excuse, you know, for not thinking about today and about what is happening right now in these cities. I give you one example. This is Oman Muscat, a city that totally depends on oil. 95% of the economy comes from the black gold that comes out of the ground. But it's the country with the smallest reserve in the world, 25 years and it's over. Only 15% of the people work. And in one generation from now, there is no economy. What should this city do to stay livable? That's another challenge than Vancouver or Zurich, with all respect, right? 
it's even a very different challenge compared to Guangzhou. They can afford to buy Harvard and become a knowledge economy, but that's not a serious proposition, is it? <laughs> right? So, what they could do is contribute to this public domain, become a front runner in the expertise around sustainability and share it with the whole world. I give you another example. Can you turn back off the lights because then the images look much better? Thank you. Eindhoven is a small town, 200,000 people in the southeast of Holland, close to the German border in a strong economic region that goes across, you know, borders of countries. It was voted the world's smartest region. And that was because they had a very clear plan and they share it with everybody. So they call themselves Brainport because Holland has got a big airport, which is Schiphol, and a big seaport, which is the second largest in the world, which is Rotterdam. And now it also has a Brainport, airport, seaport, Brainport. And I'm sorry that this is a big text slide, but I will summarize for you if you cannot read it all the way in the back. They say, first of all, everything we do is open. You can join us as an innovation company, as a government, as an academic institution, as a university. You're all more than welcome, as long as you share. Open innovation with clearly stated goals, creating business opportunities for very local employers. Secondly, you can join us, but you join everybody. This is a concept for all of us. Cooperation and a membership structure for all the companies and institutions that join the initiative of making this a brain board is compulsory. Stakeholders have an interest in the success and they get an opportunity to commit themselves to the progress of that city in the long term. Thirdly, invest time to build relationships with stakeholders. Don't leave that uh, as a job on the side for the researchers or the businessmen. It's a dedicated job to build relationships, pay people for that. And run multiple projects at any time. I just showed you that chart with these bubbles of which many are started, few get selected and some are implemented. Now Eindhoven Brainport runs 80 projects at any time in innovation and the livability of the city. They're either in development or in implementation already. There are 80, that's a lot. Only few will make it all the way to implementation and become a huge success, but many will deliver on at least some of their goals. And set these goals very concretely so you can constantly measure outcome because that has turned out to be a great motivator for all the stakeholders that the outcome is measurable. So how does that translate to what I do? Well, I'm interested in light because I have a passion for that and in healthcare because I think that's crucial when you build a livable city in the future. What we see, and this is not a prediction because I don't believe in predictions, it's a vision that prevention is becoming more and more important that you can take care of your own health if technology enables you to do so. Your blood pressure meter at home can deliver data to the doctor at any time. Medication is already able to not only to be chemical, uh, but, but also you swallow the technology that, that measures inside your body what is happening. And these kind of things. So self-health is a very important aspect of the livable city. Because if you need to go to the hospital all the time, it's incredible pressure on traffic, mobility, pollution, and so forth and so on. So we bring healthcare to every individual and we connect it to the doctors and hospitals that are important for you. That means that you do not only think about the body, but also the mind and the soul and see healthcare more as a holistic concept, addressing all aspects of humanity. And with everybody becoming older and staying healthier longer, we really need to think in our cities 
about the older people and how to keep them actively engaged in what is happening. And that is something that we call active aging. I showed this picture in the morning in the talk about open innovation and design, which is a great illustration of how, an, how a hospital could be more engaging and more inspiring for patients and therefore uh, almost more cooperative. In lighting, and I'm sorry that I have to give you such a quick summary of these topics, but we can talk about it later, I presume. I think most important is to give the city comfort and make it a stimulating environment. Comfort, not as comfort like a four-course dinner can be comfort, but comfort in the sense like quality of the space around you. It was very rightfully said by Rocco, is it the architecture that makes the city or is it the city that makes the architecture? Well, the negative space between those buildings is extremely important. And at night you can extend the time that people can pleasantly and comfortably use that and give them a whole opportunity to meet and interact and explore in the evenings when they don't have to work. This is the visual language of the cities of Asia. Yeah? A city full of bright lights. It means it's a symbol for success, for power, for money. But the future of lighting in the city is not about these icons. It's about subtlety and modulation. There's a profound change coming up of the visual language of the urban environment. And it's a huge opportunity for lighting designers and the entire lighting industry to join that. Because this is how we light the building today. And this is just an example. It's not every night lit up like this. But in the future, that could be like this, which is equally beautiful and operates at a, at a fraction of the pollution and, 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 and stress on the city. Oi. I just wanted to show you this photograph because this is natural light. Daylight will become much more important in our perception of the city, spaces, public buildings, and so forth and so on. I think we're only scratching the surface of the opportunities that daylight offers us to create a quality environment. And finally, I want to introduce to you our air model. Like we run a big think tank around the world which is called the Livable City. And we believe out of the, uh, based on the findings that come out of that think tank, that cities should try to find again their authenticity, include everybody, whether they are immigrants, new people, older people, youngsters, students, grown-ups, families, be inclusive and try to be resilient, which means you don't know what the future brings, but you are fit for it. Um, I'm coming to an end. This is more or less the cities I'm talking about, big and small. And I want to conclude with the quote that I also mentioned this morning, and I just added it at the last minute because there were so many positive reactions. In 1630, long ago, René Descartes visited Amsterdam and wrote to his friend, this is a great city. It's a city, an inventory, of the possible. Thank you very much.